All right, so uh, our second speaker this morning is Scott Gerber. He's gonna talk about uh, quantitative um, phosphoproteomic strategies addressing, um, uh, I can't read my handwriting, addressing uh, something by kinases associated with lung cancer. <laughs> I have no idea. Activities, that's what it is, addressing activities. Okay. And with that, and with I'll, that uh, I'll get started. All right, so first I want to just start by, uh, by uh, thanking Ben for the invitation uh, to come and, and share our sort of early and burgeoning work uh, with you in the area of phosphoproteomics and cancer. Um, uh, I'm uh, currently at, uh, at now the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Um, Theodore Geisel uh, uh, recently left a, um, a substantial amount of money to the institution, and so the um, the medical school was actually named, some of you may know Theodore Geisel by his other name, um, Dr. Seuss. Uh, so I've heard all of the jokes before about uh, Horton Hears a Heartbeat as part of our new curriculum and other things. So, um, so my lab, uh, you know, started, as Ben mentioned earlier, from a, a strongly analytical background, but we've uh, become more and more interested in um, dynamic biology and how mass spectrometry in particular can be used to monitor um, problems in, di in dynamic biology. And the system in which we're mostly focused, biologically speaking, is the cell cycle. You saw a little bit of that in Ben's talk. He set me up very nicely uh, for the research that's going on in my own program. Specifically in the cell cycle, we're interested in by far the most interesting part of, of the cell cycle, mitosis. This is the phase of the cell cycle where two cells actually tear themselves in half. They separate their genetic material into two daughter cells. This is happening in 10 to the seventh to 10 to the eight cells in each of us as we sit here right now. And importantly, it happens accurately with high fidelity because errors in this process result in aneuploidy and all human tumors are aneuploid. Aneuploidy is the state of having an unequal number of chromosomes in the two daughter cells. And cells have engineered mechanisms to, to die, to kill themselves, when they sense that DNA is being misproportioned into the daughter cells during cell division. Much of this process is regulated by the activity of kinases. They drive cells through the cell cycle, and my lab is in particular interested in a couple of these, the polo-like kinase family members, in particular PLK1, and the aurora kinase family members, um, in particular aurora kinase A. What's interesting about these molecules is that they're oncogenes by the classical definition of oncogenesis. You can overexpress them in normal cells like fibroblasts and they'll persist in soft auger assays, but they're never mutated. They're almost always overexpressed in cancers, but they're really never mutated. If you look in databases for people who've done large-scale exome and whole genome sequencing, such as that in Cosmic, the number of mutations that are found for these two highly overexpressed and oncogenic kinases approaches the error rate of, of mutation identification. So these are not driving the cancer per se, but they are important for, the, for sort of the maintenance of cancer once it has been established. It's important also to recognize in the system that we work in is specifically in lung cancer that 40% of all lung cancers have no known driver mutation associated with them. Cancer, as Ben mentioned, is a genetic disease. But there are many, many sort of tumors and cancer scenarios for which there is no known driver mutation. And so genomics has sort of a limited application in the context also of how do you actually treat these, um, these cancers. It's important too to recognize the small molecules that target PLK1 in this particular case and Elicertib, which targets Aurora kinase A, are working their way through the uh, clinical evaluation process. So my lab is really interested in, in stratifying how patients might be able to um, be pre-selected for their responsiveness to these drugs. Early clinical data suggests that we see strong and durable responses, but only in a very limited subset of patients. 10% of patients have very strong responses, whereas the rest of patient population, regardless of their um, PLK1 expression levels, uh, may not respond at all. And so we've developed um, highly sensitive and specific aqua-based methods for quantification of pololite kinase, both in tumors and in cell lines. Here's just showing the range of variability in a, an array of lung cancer cell lines in vitro. And um, 
many of you may be sort of in, in the proteomic space, so I'm preaching a bit to the converted, but as many of us know, message abundance and protein abundance are often very poorly correlated with one another. So why not measure the protein, right? That's um, the basis of a lot of the work that we do. What's also important to recognize is that in this particular case, and also in the case of PLK1, or sorry, Aurora kinase A, even the relative protein abundance of the kinase that we're targeting has really very little correlation to the ability of a PLK1 inhibitor to actually kill those cells. So likely what we need to do is access more information, more substrate information responsive states in order to understand more about the responsiveness of uh, cell lines or of tumors, most specifically to identify um, stratification um, uh, uh, um, approaches. So we think most people think about phosphobiology like this. You know, this is kind of what phosphobiology is for most, for most people. You have a kinase that phosphorylates protein substrates. We're done, right? We can go home. That's pretty much all there is to think about. What's important to appreciate, however, is that the phosphorylation status or the occupancy of phosphorylated substrates in cells is a dynamic process. It's a dynamic process between the kinase and opposing phosphatases, which remove these phosphates um, in, in a dynamic fashion. So in a sort of classical example, um, a protein phosphatase 1 is actually activated by a kinase. This will kind of cook your noodle a little bit when you realize that PP1 itself, when activated, also then dephosphorylates that CDK1 and turns it off again. So we used to think about, in terms of cell cycle progression, CDK1 activity increasing as cells escape S phase and reaching a maximum plateau in mitosis that results in a sort of state change in which all of a sudden you have a significant increase in phosphatase activity. And what's now sort of changed in terms of our ability to think about this process is, in fact, they dynamically oppose one another and their activities increase in tandem. It's just sort of like a jet revving its engines while the brakes are on. And then suddenly there's an event at which CDK1 activity is quickly decreased and that liberates PP1 to dephosphorylate substrates, and this is essential and crucial for exit um, from mitosis. And so really the key message here, sort of conceptually or philosophically, one might say, is that tumor phosphoproteomes really represent the balance of opposing activities. Kinases are often but not always oncogenic, and, tu and phosphatases are often but not always tumor suppressive. Um, and so it always was sort of surprising to me that people would want to um, you know, pull kinases out of tumors, for example, or cell lysates and assay their activity in vitro when it is in fact the occupancy of these phosphorylation sites in the tumor that is the most important feature of what that kinase is actually doing. To put it another way, loss of many phosphatases alone is sufficient to induce cancer. So Ben alluded to the question, you know, how, how many proteins are phosphorylated? How big is the phosphoproteome? We really don't have any idea. Some, uh, there are reports of estimates from people wiser than, than myself who've been steeped in kinase biology for many years of what they think the tumor phosphoproteome might be. And in phosphoproteomics, we have sort of multiple strategies that can be used to identify phosphorylation sites. Uh, shown here is one such shotgun approach I'll talk a little bit about in, in a minute, but we can also actually immunoprecipitate phosphopeptides using targeted approaches in which we develop antibodies against that specific phosphorylated residue or the motif surrounding that specific phosphorylated residue. And uh, a group of Albert Heck in uh, Utrecht, the Netherlands, has done a really great job of um, sort of asking, the, of using these two complementary approaches to ask how, how good are we doing at accessing information in the phosphoproteome. So in an unbiased screen, for example, using the top shotgun approach, he comes up with, in one particular report, say 11,000 phosphorylation sites. And when he does a targeted approach using an antibody that recognizes the basophilic phospho-PKA substrates, he comes up with a subset of that. Intriguingly, there's a very small overlap between them, suggesting that we really have a long way to go in order to actually 
get at all of the information that would sort of cause these Venn diagrams to, to coalesce. And you can do the same thing with these targeted approaches using antibodies that specifically recognize phosphotyrosine versus that of uh, large-scale unbiased phosphoproteomic screens. So probably an estimate on the order of a half a million to a million phosphorylation sites dynamically occurring in, in real human cells is, is likely quite, quite accurate. Um, and so uh, it's also important to remember it now, too, that as we think about developing these technologies and moving them towards sort of translationally towards the clinic, um, that regulatory agencies are going to take notice, as they probably should, and become involved. And here's a recent report, a perspective from, um, from members, uh, actually, of the Cancer Biology um, Program at NCI with uh, some suggestions for how we would maybe want to um, think about this moving forward. I, I also took note of this particular report because it turns out my program director is one of the authors of this paper, so uh, note, note, note to file, probably a good idea. So what I want to uh, do in, in the last few minutes here um, is give you a couple of small vignettes of, of things that are uh, going on in my research program, hopefully um, leave you with some tools or strategies, those of you who are doing proteomics in your own research programs, of, um, of ways that we're both thinking about using information on phosphoproteomics in real human tumors, but also just sort of technically um, what's working for us very well in our lab um, and how you might be able to use it in your own, in your own group. We'll talk a little bit about a, a method that we developed and published a couple years ago and an application for that for um, phosphopeptide enrichment. We'll talk about how we can recover information that's lost in specific types of um, SILAC experiments. And then we'll apply these two strategies to the analysis of lung cancer phosphoproteomes to investigate the stability of how stable phosphorylation sites are actually in real human tumors. If we, ex if we go through the process of excising tumors from patients, um, are we losing information or, or how stable are the, are their phosphoproteomes? So here's the classical workflow. Um, some or many of you may be doing this type of work uh, in your own lab. Cells are lysed. A significant protein input is required to then fractionate by large-scale strong cation exchange chromatography that peptidome into fractions. And then classically, people would take each of those fractions and enrich them for phosphorylation. Um, we published a paper a couple of years ago now in which it basically we optimized uh, various parts of this pathway and used co-solvents like lactic acid to improve the selectivity of the process such that we could reliably and quantitatively and reproducibly access phosphoproteomic information by doing a single stage of TI2 enrichment on the entire whole cell lysate digest directly. And that would allow us to use more efficient and smaller solvent containing sort of smaller ID 2.1 millimeter SCX columns. We're now also doing high pH reverse phase and hillock chromatography to fractionate this smaller amount of resulting phosphopeptides into fractions um, and analyzing them. And I don't want to dwell on the details. Again, this work was published a number of years ago. You're welcome to take a look at it. But we do pretty well by this approach, and we've gotten better at it since we've published this particular paper. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to share with you some of the tricks and tips that we've um, implemented since that time. And just to show you another specific application of this, not only is it helpful sort of in reducing the, the manual manipulation required to perform 24 enrichment steps, for example, instead of just one, but it's also been really helpful to do our immunoprecipitation experiments. So in a single one-stage TiO2, we can take a large amount of input completely solubilize it in buffers that are compatible for this phosphoenrichment and access a significant number of um, phosphotyrosine-containing phosphopeptides via this approach. Uh, I think this number still stands as one of the larger, if not the largest, single analysis of phosphotyrosine peptides um, from whole cell lysate digests. And another thing that we recognize very quickly is that, um, as I mentioned before, a significant amount of material is required to actually do this, uh, to, to, to perform a phosphoproteomic experiment because roughly 1% of the peptidome is, uh, is, contains phosphate. And for many people um, who are working in primary tissues or animals, um, it's not possible to chemically label 5 milligrams of peptides. 
Many people are doing ITRAC or TMT type um, chemical labeling post-harvest. That's a cost prohibitive amount of input. I'm sure Thermo Electron and AB Sachs would love it if you wanted to label five milligrams of, of peptide, but um, that would cost you many thousands of dollars to do. So here now we have a strategy by which we have a smaller amount of input into this process. And as I mentioned earlier, we showed in our primary publication on this that this could be quantitative through, um, at that time, label-free uh, quantitative phosphoprydio mix. But this is now compatible with chemical tagging. And so in order to compare the two strategies, we actually did a dimethyl labeling experiment whereby we carefully lysed and digested two aliquots of HeLa cells in vitro. We independently uh, phospho-enriched them using our uh, single-stage approach. We then labeled them with the respective labels, mixed them, and performed our mass spec analysis on the mixed combination. In parallel, we did a classic SILAC experiment, which is the type of things that we were um, uh, sort of used to doing in a workflow that uh, actually mixes at the cell stage prior to this um, TiO2 so that that's done on the pooled uh, sample. And surprisingly enough, the quantitative precision of these analyses was actually pretty good. Uh, this particular analysis, this particular sample set were just asynchronous, non-changing, unstimulated HeLa cells. So the correlation plot here is as you might expect. This just represents really the analytical noise and precision of the instrument at detecting various ratios of phosphopeptides. But there's no strong bias along any single axis here. Um, and we've now uh, sort of moved this into more mitotic substrate screening experiments and uh, compared the results between them and, and, um, and they're very comparable. We've also expanded this not only for dimethylation but also for TMT labeling um, on our new Orbitrap fusion instrument. So um, this is great, so, um, but how about accessing information in, in actual primary tumors? So uh, a number of years ago, um, I think uh, three or four years ago now, the Mann Lab in Germany published a strategy by which they could do quantitative proteomics in, in tumors. And they called that um, the super SILAC um, approach, somewhat unfortunate colloquialism, but um, we prefer spike in SILAC. And the idea is that you take a heavy population of cells that represent the tissue of origin, say for example if you're interested in breast cancer research, you might take five or six different breast cancer cell lines, heavy label them in vitro, and just use them as a common internal standard and aliquot them into each of the individual digests of breast cancer samples specifically, and then via a ratio of ratios approach, so this would be one particular tissue of interest, the same standard is, an, is added to a different type of tissue of interest. By a ratio of ratios approaches, the internal standards cancel and you're able to get um, direct uh, ratios of peptide or protein expression between the two states. Fairly simple strategy um, published in Nature Methods a couple of years ago by the Mann Lab in Germany. But one of the primary criticisms of the approach is that what happens if the internal standard isn't actually present in your sample of interest. And when we think about tumor biology, this might actually be really interesting stuff, right? We might actually be really interested in peptides or proteins that are specifically only expressed in the tumor and can't be rec recapitulated by um, tissue culture in cells in, in, in a dish. What do we do in cases where we have what we call orphan analytes, cases in which we have something that's specific to the tumor uh, or the tissue of interest but has no internal standard? And this is a significant problem. So in the original publication by Matthias's lab, he showed that when he used five cell lines, he was able to reduce the number of orphans to roughly 10% of the data. A single cell line um, resulted in roughly 30% of the data. And in our own analysis uh, of mouse liver using um, an immortalized uh, murine hepatocyte cell line, we also found a significant amount of information that was not present in that sample. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any other different hepatocyte cell lines to mix, and so we were forced to actually work in, in this space alone. So our answer, our solution to this um, problem is to actually use what we call surrogates of the internal standard for the analyte, for the orphan analyte of interest. Let's say this is our orphan analyte that is present in two different samples. 
and maybe it's at different amounts in the two samples, and so we're interested in that quantitative difference. All, and, however, it doesn't have a, um, a corresponding heavy cognate from the standard itself. What we do is we use surrogate heavy peptides, regardless of whether they have light or um, regardless of whether they have light components in any of the two samples, and we take the median value of an ensemble of all of these heavy peptides to use as a correction factor for the ratio of um, our two analytes, our two orphan analytes of interest. And the median is used because it's quite robust to outlier values. There is always a distribution of intensities when we take these ratios initially, um, and so the median is quite robust to these outliers. Is it clear? So basically all we're doing is using this surrogates as um, a correction factor ratio when we um, take the, the ratio of the two uh, actual analytes of interest. And so to validate this um, strategy, we used um, uh, murine liver tissue and a standard derived from an immortalized hepatocyte. This is a TIB75 cell line. Mixed these two in defined ratios and separated them by strong cation exchange chromatography. We took replicates across the uh, doubly charged solution charge state space of this uh, separation. And what we can see is that for different fractions, we actually get different distributions and slightly different correction factors. And so we use these on a strong cation exchange fraction specific basis to correct for the uh, identification or the quantification of, of, um, of orphans. So this is what the data set looks like overall. These are things that we were able to quantify that ha actually had a heavy cognate in both samples. So these are the super SILAC ratios that we get from this data, uh, and roughly 2,500 of them. This is applying the surrogate strategy on these exact same peptides. So all we're doing here is ignoring the fact that they have a heavy cognate. And we're using the correction factor derived from the previous um, uh, slide on the same uh, data set, uh, just multiplying by that sort of inverse correction factor ratio. And what we see is that the, this sort of distribution, this tail towards um, a higher value uh, is, sh is pushed back into the distribution overall and provides a, a more normal shape to that distribution. This is, these are the orphans in this particular experiment. So in this particular experiment, we actually had more orphans than we had specific uh, analytes that could be recovered. And this is now the sum of the two data sets all together. So this is now adding together all of the orphans that were recovered by this process as well as all of the um, original super SILAC quantifications. And this led us to the hypothesis that we could use any cell line so long as it was heavy labeled and so long as it had some representation to the target tissue of interest. And so uh, the graduate student who did this work kind of went crazy and just decided, all right, I'll just take 3T3 fibroblasts, which have no physical, physiological relationship whatsoever to liver tissue, heavy label them, and use those as an internal standard in the exact same experiment. So he repeated the entire experiment except using this heavy 3T3 labeled pool. And again, um, the sur uh, surrogate approach recovers a significant amount of information. Half of this sample actually were orphans and we doubled the amount of um, quantitated peptides recovered in this particular approach. So I'm a little bit behind, so I'll kind of move quickly through the next couple of slides to get to some interesting stuff at the very end. So um, we recently published a report last year on spike in SILAC analysis of uh, lung cancer tumors looking at phosphoproteomes in lung cancer. And specifically here, the graduate student, Devin Schweppe, who did this work, heavy labeled a number of lung cancer cell lines in vitro and used the exact same approach I described earlier to quantify uh, phosphorylation sites in primary lung tumors. Shown here are just the intermediate quantitative precision of two different replicates. These are the primary um, analyte to internal standard ratios for uh, the two different tumors analyzed in replicate um, on our LTQ Orbitrap instrument. And this is what the data set looks kind of like overall when we take the ratio of phosphorylation sites um, in tumor A uh, to its internal standard divided by B to its internal standard. See uh, a distribution of sites. There are things that are enriched in tumor A and some things are enriched in tumor B. Importantly, we're able to access information in this particular experiment that we couldn't find anywhere else. 
That is to say, there may be novel phosphorylation sites or novel uh, PTMs that are actually in organisms that are not uh, yet available to us through analysis of cell lines um, and, and uh, uh, things in, in vitro. So what do you do with this information, right? You've got 9,000 phosphorylation sites in, in, in two tumors. I mean, you know, sort of mind-boggling kind of what, what m one might be able to do with this type of information. So one particular approach, and this is just representative that, that we're thinking about, is to ask questions about, is to sort of reduce the dimensionality of the data set a little bit um, through the use of motif analysis. So in this particular experiment, um, Devin asked the question, all right, which uh, motifs exist in the data set, and is there any enrichment in one tumor for specific motifs versus the other? And he found um, a number of uh, motifs including some basophilic motifs that were up in one particular cancer, some acidophilic motifs that looked like they were up in the other tumor, and some that didn't look like they changed very much at all between the two tumors. And the idea here is that this may help us in terms of um, both reducing dimensionality, now we can cluster based on, for example, motifs. Um, it's possible also to develop antibodies that target unique or specific motifs. Uh, and also to identify targets. These are representative kinases that might or that have been known to phosphorylate these motifs. Um, we're not asserting that they are actually the kinases in the tumors quite yet, but those are testable hypotheses that now could be, um, could be prosecuted. So in just the last couple of minutes, uh, I wanted to just show you some of the other things that we're, we're working on. So we previously reported on a strategy to identify PLK1 candidate sub, um, substrate phosphorylation sites in science signaling a couple of years ago um, using SILAC, we just inhibit one particular uh, pool of cells and we have a control um, population of cells. The inhibitor is a, um, is a kinase inhibitor that's specific to the molecule we're interested in. And so then by reduction in phosphorylation site ratio, we're able to a uh, ascertain which phosphor phosphorylation sites respond to the inhibitor and thus are candidate substrates of the kinase of interest. And so if we then look in the tumors, we, Devin took the data set that we had done in vitro, actually this was done in, 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 um, in HeLa cells, and asked, are any of these PLK1 phosphorylation sites actually present in the lung tumor data set that I just showed you? Um, a number of them are present in the data set, and it looks like there's an enrichment in terms of intensity for many of these in one of the two tumors. Uh, looks like it's actually in tumor B versus tumor A um, than the other. And sure enough, it turns out that there is more PLK1 kinase actually being expressed in that particular tumor. Um, and this is representative of some of the biology that PLK1 is involved in. So this gives you a sense of some of the kinase-specific substrate ohm or some of the applications that we might be able to use to ask questions about whether or not a kinase, regardless of whether its protein is expressed highly in one tumor or not, might be more active or the opposing phosphatases might be um, less active. There is more dynamic information in phosphoproteomes than there is in the proteome itself. So these are phosphopeptide ratios um, for several uh, proteins and their phosphorylation sites between um, the two tumors. The corresponding proteins uh, didn't change hardly at all, and in fact, in some cases, one uh, ERK was actually increased in one tumor versus another, um, when, whereas the protein was slightly uh, increased, uh, decreased in that specific tumor. So in just the last minute, I want to just tell you a little bit about the stability study that we did. So this is a small-scale clinical uh, study that we uh, conducted actually at the Cancer Center um, there at Dartmouth. So uh, five tumors were actually excised from patients. These are stage two non-small cell lung adenocarcinomas. They were excised from the patient. Um, two of these tumors were, all, all five of these tumors were cut into thirds. Two of the tumors were actually lysed immediately, snap frozen and then lysed immediately after resection. Um, whereas the other three tumors were cut into thirds and allowed to remain in a pan in the OR, in the dissection room right next to the OR, for either uh, an additional 90 minutes or, an, sorry, an additional 60 minutes or an additional 120 minutes post-resection. The median time to snap freezing, um, which is the amount of time it took between resection and actually uh, getting them um, 
uh, cut into thirds and, and processed was 30 minutes. And then we actually lysed the tumor tissue mixed with our internal standard and performed enrichment for phosphorylation sites. Um, so the punchline really, uh, I'm behind here a little bit. So tumor proteins are actually quite stable over two hours. So what you're looking at is all of the data for the two second time points um, taken. So, so you take the initial time point and you divide it into the plus 60 and plus 120 minute time points. These are the actual data aligned, and here are a box and whisker plots for each of the 90 and 150 minute time points. Tumor proteins are relatively stable even at room temperature in a pan. These are fairly large sections of tumor. They're roughly three quarters of a centimeter um, cubed for uh, each of the three different tumors. Surprisingly, the phosphorylation sites were also very stable as a function of time. We did see some phosphorylation sites moving in different directions, but um, as it turns out, those phosphorylation sites weren't consistently changing between one tumor and the next. So here's a, uh, just a hierarchical clustering map of the data shown in the previous slide for phosphorylation sites that are actually in common between the three tumors that were allowed to vary in time. And reassuringly, each tumor clustered with its other time point, and the time points themselves did not cluster together. So tumor two, both time points from one tumor actually clustered together uh, and so forth. And a principal component analysis also very reassuringly had um, the first three uh, loadings for this PCA analysis uh, comprise, I think, 70% of the variability of this data set. And uh, in every case, the two time points uh, clustered together for a specific tumor, and each of the tumors was quite unique um, relative to the others. So, so just to review really quickly, um, here's... Uh, you know, the, the phosphoproteomic single-stage paper that I had talked about, actually you can, you can find that in, in, the, in, the, in the literature. Our surrogate approach for rescuing information um, from spike and silac experiments was done last fall. We also published the initial description of this uh, non-small cell lung cancer phosphoproteome information in uh, Journal of Proteomics, and the um, stability study is in review. Um, Devin actually did all of the stability study work as well as the two tumor work. Jason Gilmore was primary. He's a graduate student. This is, I don't know why they're not looking at the camera. Why are they staring? Maybe it's a beautiful day or something. It happens actually in New England to have weather like this too. But, um, and also funding agencies, um, our collaborators in thoracic oncology were uh, crucial for this. And I'd be happy to maybe answer a question. I don't know if we have time, but sorry for going over a few minutes. Thanks again. Hey, Ben. We just use a single, we, we, yeah, so the question is, um, is there really, do we really have to make an effort to try and match the internal standard cell line to the actual tumor of interest or to the system of interest? Um, given the fact that the 3T3 result was so successful for um, the liver tissue. We don't. We use a single, we do, I mean, for example, in all of our work with lung cancer, we have lung cancer cell lines that do efficiently incorporate heavy amino acids. We just use a single lung cancer cell line now when we do spiking experiments. Um, given our interest in, in expanding this for larger clinical studies, we're doing um, multiplexing. So we're sort of forced to use TMT reagents in that case. But even in that case, our reference standard is one um, unlabeled lung cancer cell line in vitro. Yeah? You mentioned there are two kinases that had 7,000 parallel phosphorylation sites. Uh, I mean, right, so um, it's sort of akin to the junk DNA days, right? And I think we kind of learned our lesson a little bit, um, you know, uh, back then about what some of these intergenic regions in, in the genome actually mean, you know, microRNAs and so forth. So I, I think um, 
you know, validation of functional importance is always the bottleneck in any of these experiments. Um, but, you know, each one is a candidate hypothesis of a mechanism, and if you build some mechanistic information into the experiment, uh, you know, that, that has, um, you know, importance for downstream validation. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>